Welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I am your host, Olivia Fierro, and this program has a very specific goal of convincing all on planet Earth that talking about books is never boring. And if you think it is, then it's quite possible that you are the boring person in all of your conversations. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. So everything can shift with this conversation here. Uh, we've got a moment with Margaret coming up in just a little bit where she is going to take a look at all of the books where libraries are key to the story and you are going to understand why as I introduce you to our guest who I'm so thrilled to be joined by today New York Times best-selling author Jojo Moyes and her latest The Giver of Stars is out on paperback so if you haven't read this yet what is the matter with you do not wait one second longer I won't tolerate it she won't tolerate it um, also, big news for her from the summer, The Last Letter from Your Lover, a novel is being adapted into a film, and that is going to be streaming on Netflix July 23rd. So grab your popcorn, get yourself a love interest, at least by that date, at least for those couple of days, and then you can dump them and move on. So Jojo, thank you so much for joining us all the way from England. Appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. What an intro. I might just need you to introduce me every day. I am for hire. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so we, as a part of our book club, read The Giver of Stars. And I, I had to say, gosh, you know, I was so mad at myself that I had not been, you know, stalking all of your books leading up to this point. And that's the beauty of book clubs is when people are giving you a nudge to read something that yeah. you have for some reason had been under a rock and hadn't found. So this book was so special and the women just loved it. So tell me about how it was sitting down to write this work of historical fiction, really against a backdrop that most of us admitted we knew zero about. Well, likewise, I mean, I'm from England too, right? But uh, there was one uh, morning, oh gosh, back in 2017, 20, I forget now, because obviously time no longer exists since the big awfulness. Mm -hmm. um, but I was sitting down to read the whole of the internet, as writers tend to do before we actually start work. And I chanced upon an article in the Smithsonian magazine online about the horseback librarians of Kentucky. And there were these amazing black and white pictures of these women, young women in white shirts, or sometimes in kind of much more practical gear, with packs of books on mules or horses. And it said that they rode 120 miles a week as part of Roosevelt's um, attempts to get the country to recover after the Great Depression. He believed that without knowledge and facts that people were falling prey to snake oil salesmen, religious fundamentalism, and just that people needed to, to know the true facts about things. And I thought, my goodness, this is a modern story. This isn't an old story. And these women faced all sorts of prejudice and, you know, physical battles, logistical battles to get across this very mountainous terrain. And as soon as I read it, I just had that feeling in my chest, like, I have to write this. I have to write this. And I was terrified that somebody would get there before me, because to me, it was the greatest story that I'd read in an age. And then who is that wonderful guy from Star, Star Trek um, who's all over Facebook? Uh, oh, um, oh, well, not Richard Shatner. Uh, no. Uh, oh, oh, George Takai. George Takai. That's it. Yes. And he has this huge following on Facebook. And about three weeks after I'd booked my flights to head out to Kentucky to start research, he did this huge number on Facebook about it. And I just remember thinking, no, George, please don't tell anybody I need to write about this. Um, but actually, you know, it was a book I wrote kind of in a fever because it was, it was my favorite. I think I've written 14 books and it was by far my favorite because of the research, which I'll tell you about, but also just because of the story of these women, that book, said everything I wanted to say about living through 2016 to 2020, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the It seems to, just doing that a scroll of your Instagram, it, the, what's involved in this combines a lot of your passions. Horses obviously have a strong affinity yeah. for, for books and the power of the word and for, yes. you know, some, um, you know, being an agent for change or being a positive voice for yeah. truth, whether people like to hear it or not. So what a journey and what a thrill it must have been. Um, what, what, what did you find when you, when, when you, I mean, you went to Kentucky? 
Uh, three times, three times. I went in different seasons because I felt like to write, I'm, I'm one of these writers, I have to experience the thing to really make the story come alive. I, I have huge respect for people who can do it off the back of a search engine, but I can't do that. I need to smell it. I need to hear the patterns. And also it felt like a, a disrespectful thing to me to try and write about this particular part of Appalachia without experiencing it without hearing the very particular tones of the language because these people in this small part of your country have quite a a kind of ornate way of speaking it's beautiful and they're great storytellers and what i found was that once i got over there and listened to people tell stories i suddenly could find that voice and once you have the voice of a book as i'm sure other writers have told you then it flies. And and some books are like pulling teeth. And this one, I couldn't stop. I just, I was getting up at five to write. I would write through the night. I just, I heard the women. I felt the environment. I loved Kentucky. I fell in love with one of the poorest parts of America in a way that I totally hadn't expected to. And, and it's given me a kind of bunch of lifelong friendships with the the woman who I rented a cabin off in the in the middle of a holler in the middle of nowhere. I I felt like it was a life changing experience for me. Wow. And I, there's so much for us to take away from that. Mm. I mean, here we are in the US and you know much of the country is is often spoken on in various yeah. flyover country or whatever. Yeah. And you think of it as just cult a culturally you know, completely different space than what you would find on either coast. And so it is, it's so intriguing to hear that it would leave such a positive impression on you and that there's so much to learn and see and, and know about. the. People. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. When I did the initial research, I was kind of anxious about going over there. This was a place that didn't have a kind of three-star hotel within a, you know, 120 kilometers. And I ended up at a bed and breakfast run by an amazing woman called Barbara Napier, who built half of these cabins in her holler herself. She has them kind of dotted around a, a 350-acre site, which is entirely untouched apart from the pathways between them. And the first night I went to stay there, I'd done too much research, and I found out that this particular area was one of the opioid hotspots of America. And as you know, some of the less well-off counties have huge problems with um, legal drug use. And so I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what am I doing here? And actually, I think it was one of the safest places I have ever felt. I ended up living by myself in this cabin with no internet, no telephone, no TV, no communications basically, except for what you could get at the main house if you walked up. And I have never felt more free and uh once i got past the first night because it there wasn't even locks on the doors they're just little pin hooks because as barbara said well who's going to come down here you know it's it's five miles down a dirt track and i grew up in an inner city i like i just i just imagine you know intruders guns bears you name it but within a couple of days i'd, I'd relaxed into life there and the people were great the people were funny and uh oh, i just yeah i mean the language just hearing it's like the irish you know over here we have this saying the irish are born storytellers i felt mm -hmm. the same way about kentuckians they just you could i would go down for breakfast because everything was communal if you wanted to eat and i'd still be there two hours later you know <laughs> listening to someone telling me about you know taking a deer off a road or something. I don't know, but it was wonderful. <laughs> oh, that that is a, a much better probably experience for your writing than if it had worked out. They're like, well, where did the New York Times bestsellers sleep? You, have a, you, know, <laughs> you, have a, you don't have a Four Seasons? I'll helicopter in. I mean, that would, wouldn't have given yeah. you the frame of reference you needed, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, also you just, you know, I rode horseback across those mountains and it was, you know, I, I learned things that you would never learn from the internet. So for example, how quiet the forests are in the day, like how they're an explosion of noise at dawn, but then they go really quiet and, and the sound a horse's hooves make and how horses react to going through certain terrain, all those facts I needed for, to bring the book alive, what people would eat, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I loved the research trips. They were as much a pleasure as they were, 
you know, anything that I would consider real work. Ah, oh, that is so cool. Generally, when you are writing and you're saying, okay, I've got a deadline for myself, either either set by your publisher or you've set for mm -hmm. yourself, do you need to remove yourself from your kind of daily life or are you able to focus and, and go with it? It's hard. I have three kids and a bunch of animals. And what I've found is that you can pretty much rely on any day to throw up, you know, <laughs> a sick kid or a sick dog or, you know, some part of my house falling down. My house is very old. It was built in 1619. So it's like a constant um, series of repairs. I'm on first name terms with every tradesman within 30 miles here, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I think being in a place that had no communications was a really interesting experience for me because I, I like to stay pretty connected. You know, I'm a typical person of now. I have Twitter, I have Facebook, I have WhatsApp, you name it. I'm chatting to people all day long. And there you have to be alone with your thoughts. And that's kind of scary. But also for a writer, it's wonderful because I would just go for a hike and then I would come back and words would spill out of me. So yeah, it was good. For those who are listening who have not yet read Giver of Stars, tell us about Alice and how you you come up with her. And I, I kind of love, I'm thinking about you now on your research journeys and thinking about the way that Americans respond to accents, British accents, we just automatically put give you all, you know, 50 more IQ points to whatever. So <laughs> I, I love, I love the way that Alice is um i mean she is just very uh, she's as about as foreign as they've ever seen <laughs> yeah well that's the thing about these communities is they tended to be very insular and this is why they've maintained uh, you know a lot of them are descended from elizabethan england mm -hmm. or the scots or whatever and they've tended to keep within their own communities so outsiders tend to get a slightly uh, standoffish response, unless you're in the hospitality business, obviously. And that I love those stories about communities where someone's trying to break in. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's not. And Alice, it, Alice would be a, a square peg in a round hole wherever she goes. She's just one of these naturally awkward people. And she has married Bennett, who is the son of a local mine owner uh, in this part of Eastern Kentucky, thinking that she's going to go and live in a place that is, I don't know, she's thinking of the Queen Mary, she's thinking of New York, she's thinking of Kentucky Derby. And what she gets is a kind of mining town uh, in what she would consider the middle of nowhere. But what what I felt I needed to do as a an English writer was to accept that to some extent I had to see my fictional place as the eyes of an outsider because, you know, I didn't grow up in Kentucky. There are going to be a, a ton of things that I don't know or don't understand. So I had a number of characters who were from Kentucky, but for a lot of the book, you are looking at it through Alice's eyes and experiencing what she does, which is at first a kind of slight disappointment and anxiety and, and loneliness. But then once she joins the pack of librarians, these women, they, they empower each other. I really wanted to write about female friendship as well, because I get really tired of the narratives that pit women against each other that says, if you have two young women in a room, they have to be in competition. That's not my experience. You know, I'm 51 years old and my whole life, women have been some of the greatest allies, whether at work or at play. And so I wanted to write a book about what happens when women really come together and support each other in great physical tasks, not just emotional and mental ones but you know these women are tough and that was the other characteristic of a lot of the women who i met they are tough you're not going to mess with them they you know they've li lived hard scrabble lives and i i love that kind of woman they they're just the greatest to write about yeah these women i mean they are not afraid to stand out and they are making a major social change in their community and they're putting mm -hmm. in many ways putting a target on their backs and putting themselves in jeopardy um marjorie obviously being sort of the perfect antidote to alice because she is comes across fearless and later we learn um, many, many hardships that she's gone through mm -hmm. uh, but she must have been a very fun cr uh, character to craft much more so like the women you were meeting in Kentucky and, and, and oh. reading about and reading about that were actually part of this. 
Uh, Marjorie, I think, is the favorite character of all the women I've ever created. And, and like the best characters, she fell into my lap, fully formed with her dusty coat and her hat. And I just wanted to write about a woman who only ever looked outwards. She wasn't concerned about how the world sees her. I think mm -hmm. as women, we find it really hard to learn that lesson. And sometimes it takes us until we're kind of 40 to really understand that we don't actually care too much how we're viewed. Mm -hmm. I think we spend all our young years feeling anxious. How do I look? What do people think? And Marjorie is someone who's been through so much, even by the time she hits adulthood, and she knows what she loves, which is she loves being out in the mountains. She loves books. She loves her horse, her mule, sorry. And she, she's a woman who just wants to live her life without reference to anybody else. But what she learns from becoming close and this formation of the pack of librarians is that actually it's okay to be a little bit vulnerable. It's okay to rely on people. And, and she learns how to be a friend and to have a friend. And there's a deep love story, if you like, between Alice and Marjorie, who both gained something from each other. Oh, very much. And, and all of the women uh, begin to flourish and tap into maybe a strength that they didn't realize they had mm -hmm. or a vulnerability that they didn't realize they had because of the connection of this group. Yes. And you just imagine, I imagine every other person in, in town, every other woman in town, um, at least watching them and thinking, I wish, I wish I could, I can't say it out loud, but I wish yeah. I was doing what they were doing. I wish I was that bold, or I wish I had this sort of sorority that is so unusual at that time as women were so confined to their homes and their roles. Well, it the was house. a very patriarchal society. Yeah. I mean, if you read the historical documents from that time, most women had a pretty tough time. They were pregnant most of the time, tied to their house. Uh, there was a lot of domestic violence. But there were some, you know, standout characters. I loved reading the court records at the time, and you would find out that there's some women who terrify everybody, including the men. You know, <laughs> there were some, you know, also bred a lot of really tough women. But when I wrote Marjorie, I mean, my daughter is 23 now, and I, since she's been about 16, it's been really important to me to create female characters that would make someone like her feel good about being female, to feel stronger. Or I love books where you read about someone you think, oh, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Why can't I be like that? Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to create in Marjorie, someone that you could, if you were maybe a young woman and, and not quite sure about occupying your space, that you would think, well, what would Marjorie do? You know, and, and I, I do that with a lot of my characters. I sometimes think, well, what would Marjorie do? Um, yeah. And yeah, and also, she has a great relationship with a man yes. who treats her as an equal, who absolutely adores her, who she doesn't want to marry because she doesn't want to be tied down. But their relationship was one of the loveliest, slightly sexiest things mm -hmm. I've ever written because he just adored her the way she was. And, and that was the other thing. I wanted to write about an older woman having a successful romantic relationship that didn't involve abuse, it didn't involve you know, feeling anxious. It was just a meeting of two equals who utterly respected each other and took great pleasure in each other. And and that's what I got with her and Sven. And it was just the weirdest relationship in town, by contrast to yeah. what everybody else has going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But don't you love those people who yes. just, you look at them and you go, well, you're right out there, but I kind of like it. Yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And she just, I mean, that you think, well, that they're real soulmates. I mean, because he is, yeah. he is, he is throwing aside whatever anybody else would say about um, him in that time for ha being with such an independent mm -hmm. woman and someone who's not willing to um, have the titles and all the jobs that come mm -hmm. with a, a long-term partnership. Um, and in contrast, of course, Alice shows up in this foreign place being sold one thing and delivered another. So one of the, the, the moments that stuck out to me um, so much and I, that I had marked from when we first read the book was about a dinner and some of the dynamics in the home when she's finding out first, first of all, like that they're basically honeymooning in a, almost in a room on a with his father, with his father. <laughs> so it's just, it, we already know like, okay, this is going to get weird. And then it keeps going in that direction that it just gets weirder and weirder. But the part that I had underlined was about, um, she had just said a, a very basic disagreement of something she didn't, she spoke up calmly about, um, 
something like she'd never been a great fan of pork chops or that she personally found jazz music rather thrilling. The two men would drop their forks and stare at her with the same shocked disapproval as if she had removed all her clothes and danced a jig on the dining table. <laughs> Why do you have to be so contrary, Alice? He would whisper. And she realizes, of course, that she's better off not expressing her opinions. Mm -hmm. So it's all the more satisfying when she finds herself with people who want to hear what she thinks. But we all know women like that, right? Mm -hmm. Who've ended up with someone and over the years you've watched them just get ground down little by little and then they go like, I, I haven't got the energy to fight. I just mm -hmm. do my thing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of tragic. Mm -hmm. And I think the joy of her is that because she meets these other women who just support her and push her out there and, and Fred, the, the very gentlemanly, uh, male librarian almost. Um, He's a lovely she's able man. to find her voice. <laughs> yeah, again, I just wanted to write men who were happy to be, they're so comfortable in their own skin, these men, that they don't feel they have to dominate. Yeah. They're just like, yeah, I'm cool. She's cool. It's all good. Yeah. Perhaps okay, not we all in those go words. For Everybody yeah. should be supporting this. What's wrong with you? I like when he steps up in the meeting too and he's like just going on the record, uh, you know, of course. Yeah. Because a male opinion is more important. And so he 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 wants to make sure people are in support of it. Um, these chapters are formed with these quotations at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I I and as a reader, it's wonderful because it gives you a little tone and gives you some context. And mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of book references because obviously these women are constantly talking and thinking and and sharing books. So, I mean, lots of little women and, and various um, out of Africa, but a lot from Farm Journal and uh, the WPA Guide to Kentucky. So how did you select yeah. these passages? And did those come first from the for the chapter or vice versa? No, I just collected them as I went along. Uh, I mean, I'm a great kind of underliner and highlighter. And uh, often I... It's like I absorb a lot of this stuff, but I don't try and make notes because I find that if you overdo the research, it can kind of slow everything down. It's like you're banging the reader over the head saying, see the research that I've done. But there were some snippets. Um, I, I, I'm a great uh, buyer of old magazines off uh, auction sites. So I worked out what was the time period, what was the location, and, I, and what magazines the librarians would have been taking around because it was, it was not just books. Mm -hmm. It was uh, comics, it was magazines, it was newspapers, it was anything that would encourage people to read. And some of these things were just amazing. And I've, you know, I've got piles of them at home. I should have brought some out so that I could show you. Um, but yeah, some of the snippets were too good to waste. And I did this same thing with another book of mine many years ago called The Ship of Brides. Uh, any book that I do newspaper research for, I tend to plaster my walls with it as I'm going because I think it really, it teaches you about people's preoccupations of the time, the tone, the, the kind of names they liked. Um, and so I just thought at the end, it would be a nice thing to kind of highlight I looked at what books, for example, were in the bestseller list for that time. So I was taking extracts from some of the more popular books that they would have been handing around. It's just, it just adds flavor, you know, it all just hopefully brings it to life a bit. And even the values and, and, and some of what they're sharing is re bringing recipes you know, to home and, and. Oh, I mean, there's one thing where a woman uh, says that she would never serve a pie that was a day old like the horror and I was thinking oh my god I think I have things in the back of my fridge that date back to 1987 like what <laughs> a fresh pie every day every day I think well I think it was because her husband would never eat it if it yes. was more than it. yes yes exactly <laughs> can't let that husband go with a day old pie uh, how offensive, obviously. Um, the, a couple of the references to Little Women and Louisa May Alcott, and I imagine that you must have loved that book very much, and it, yes. there was sort of a, a, an in-spirit insp inspiration or dynamic between these women in this mm -hmm. particular place in The Giver of Stars. Well, also, my there is a little bit of an in-joke, which is there is a murder weapon at the beginning of the book, which is a copy of, re revealed to be a copy of Little Women. And I like the fact that someone gets killed using a copy of Little Women. It feels like a kind of, maybe it's only me who finds it funny, but I just enjoyed putting it in. Um, yeah. And upset about the, the cover being damaged. Yes. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes. Because if you, you know, 
the thing about we're, we're so lucky in the West. We have access to so much. You can buy books online. You've got libraries if you choose to use them. You, we, most of us, if we're lucky, have got shelves of books. And it's easy to forget how valuable something like that would have been to a family that had nothing. I mean, a lot of these families were sleeping on the porch or on beds made of straw out the back. These are people who had almost nothing. If you look at the photographs of that time, they led such a bare existence. Mm -hmm. And so to have a book that you love damaged would have really scarred you. And I think, you know, Marjorie never forgave her father for that one thing. Mm -hmm. And the magic and, and, and set against the the poverty and the physical challenges and, mm. and the separation and of all, all that was happening at this time in this place. The magic of a book is kind of the portal to take you elsewhere and to open up opportunity and thought is, you yes. know, more dramatic than ever. Well, if you look at societies where women uh, have reduced status, I mean, if you look at some of the things that are happening, say in Afghanistan, what's the first thing that occupying uh, forces do? They take away books. Mm -hmm. They take away education for women, especially. They want them without knowledge because knowledge is power. And so what's the first thing you do to help a woman reclaim her power? You give her something to read. Mm -hmm. And then you teach her that there's other ways to be. You teach her how to make stuff. You teach her how to, you know, how power works, all those things. So for me, adult education as well has been a, a huge presence in my life. I mean, one of the things that I do over here is I fund a charity called Quick Reads, where we get big name authors to write short novellas, like 17, 20,000 words that are very fast, very pacey, funny, easy to read, uh, that are given away or charged, like it would be about a dollar twenty, I think, um, mm -hmm. per book. And it's so that people who might be daunted by reading, say, if English, English was a second language or if they were in prison or if they had never learned to read because there's a massively high correlation between uh, women in prison and no literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you can encourage people to read, you get them on the first run. Mm -hmm. And then it's so lovely when you hear about people who, who were dyslexic or who never had the opportunity who suddenly just flourish. I mean, there's a pop star over here, uh, a guy called Brian, I think his name is Brian Harvey or from E17 or one of the members of E17, who said before lockdown, he had never read a book. And he was, he's my age, so he's like 50 odd. And because of lockdown, he read a book and then he read another. And by the end of lockdown, he'd read 40 books and had decided to write his own. And I just love those stories. It's like it's like someone gets a light switched on. Uh -huh. It's fantastic. Anyway, wow! So, yeah. What what a great program too. Thank thank you so much for for participating in something like that and for sharing it um, so that we can know about that as well. That's a phenomenal a phenomenal concept. Um, I want to ask you about what you first. Well, when I speak to novelists in particular, I want to know, you can't be a great writer without being an, a passionate reader. So yeah. do you remember what it was then? Which book it was? What series it was? What moment oh. in, in time that just did that for you? That you knew whether you realized you were going to be a professional, world-famous writer or not, you knew that books would be part of your life. I, I was an only child till I was 19, so and there was no TV because I'm that old. So uh, books were always the most important thing in my free time. And my parents were both, uh, they didn't have much money, but they passionately believed that I should be allowed to read anything. So every week I was allowed to buy six comic books from the store. And also I read my way through their library. And also we went to the local library where I could get four books out. And I read everything. I read the Bible. I read The Joy of Sex. I read uh, every comic book you can imagine. I just basically plowed through everything. And I don't think there was one particular book because I read, it I mean, I just, yeah, there, was, there were no limits on what I read. And so... I mean, the Bible took me forever, but it was really interesting <laughs> as well. I can't imagine reading that now, but I, you know, maybe I was a strange kid to just go <laughs> cover to cover. Um, but I do remember one of the books that has made a huge impact on me and which is still one of my favorite books today and my favorite film of all time is an American book called The Black Stallion by Walter Farley. 
and it's about a boy and a horse who get shipwrecked on a desert island and how they keep each other alive and what happens when he returns to civilization. And it's it's quite allegorical. It's like the, the horse almost becomes a father. It's a bit like the Narnia books in that respect, but it's so compelling. And Francis Ford Coppola did a film version of it. And that image of the boy and the horse has stayed with me my entire life. I've written books with horses in. I've ended up with my own horses. I don't know what it is, but sometimes when you're a child, it just, there's something that lodges. And for me, I think it was Walter Farley's The Black Stallion. Beautiful. And I'm looking at your all your book covers right now and also notice just today or this week, The Horse Dancer. I thought, wait, is that new? Do I have my books out of order? What is that, 2017? Um, it's like number one on... Or it's a top seller on Amazon this week. Is it? Oh, yes. That's lovely. <laughs> I, I try not to look too hard at those sorts of things because I think it's the route to madness for novelists. I oh, feel I'm like sure. I know so many people who spent years kind of refreshing every hour to see if they were moving up or down. And the fact is, you're always going to move up or down. So, but that's lovely. The Horse Dancer, when it first came out, was not my most popular. It's quite an odd story because it was loosely inspired by the Black Cowboys of Philadelphia, who I you may have heard of, which is a sort of group of urban cowboys in Philadelphia. And there was a girl, uh, a young woman of color called Mecca Harris, a 14 year old girl who won a polo scholarship. She was so talented at riding. And her mother and she unfortunately was shot dead in a drug deal that went wrong. And I never forgot how this girl was almost elevated out of her life by the love of horses. Mm -hmm. And I dedicated that book to her because the story just, it haunted me. And I was an inner city kid who fell in love with horses mm -hmm. and they kind of got me out of my life as well. I was just so happy. I used to go and work at the local stables every day that I could basically get up at half past five in the morning. I must've been crazy, but I loved it. Um, and the horse dancer is sort of based on some of those experiences of, of, of city horses. And because it was a slightly esoteric subject, I don't think it did very well when it first came out. And then the German, a German company made a German film of it. And since then, it's sort of been building in popularity. It's quite strange. Some of these books have a second life, which is really lovely. Awesome. I know. I think it is fun too when just with like we're speaking now, the opportunity of something coming out in paperback makes it more affordable, yeah. more portable, more exactly. You know, just, and another opportunity to talk about a great story because sometimes you miss great books. The the stacks get too high it's and you true. just miss, miss it. Uh, this is my little bit where I just tell people go to your local library as well because it's the same in America as it is here. If we don't use them. Uh, we lose them. And, yes. you know, you can always get a librarian to recommend you some good books by the same author that you like. So, yes, they know their stuff. No doubt. They about do know it. their stuff. You mentioned film. So I do want to just quickly ask you mm -hmm. about the Netflix movie that's coming out this July. The trailer is yeah. very beautiful and sexy. <laughs> I had a lot Thank of you. like, Ooh, um, wow, this is stunning. So how what is is that process really like as an author? I imagine it's it must be like a, a push and pull of I, I'm so excited and also do everything exactly as I want or I'm I can't look. <laughs> yeah, well, this one is a funny one because this one actually got optioned 11 years ago. This has been a long burn. Um, I always felt that it was not an adaptable story because it's a complicated timeline. It, it's a sort of three-stage timeline overlapping. And yet it's one of the books that people who read my books are most passionate about. Um, but the various production companies stuck with it. And then luckily for us, Shailene Woodley from Big Little Lies came on board, as did Felicity Jones from The Theory of Everything. Uh, we have just the most wonderful leads. And they, they were executive producers as well. And I've kind of been involved pretty much for the last four years on this one. Um, I, I try to be quite involved in adaptations of my own work. I wrote the script of Me Before You, which was the film that most people know me for. And that was such a learning curve, but it was such a useful experience because when you are watching actors rehearse or on a set, you suddenly understand the importance of movement, the importance of, you know, so if you have two, two actors running, for example, or say there's an explosion, not that I get many explosions in my books, <laughs> It matters less 
what the actors are saying because the audience are going, oh, bang, or, you know. But if you have two people who are static in a room, that script has to be so sharp. And what, are, you know, where is the camera going to be? This is the thing I've learned over the years, which is ask yourself all the time, where is the camera? Mm -hmm. And as a writer who's always worked with words, it's really hard to switch your thinking from beautiful, you know, descriptions or language to where is the camera? Where is the camera? Am I telling the story enough in, in these bunch of words everything you write in a script has to either tell you something about the character or move the plot forward so it's much more technical but I love it it's turned out that now I have a kind of dual career which is I write scripts and I write books and they seem to occupy quite different parts of my brain but I've been lucky I've worked with really good people and I've worked with two amazing women directors Thea Sharrock who did Me Before You and Augustine Frizzell who's done The Last Letter and luckily, because we all had the same kind of way of thinking about things, the books are actually pretty close to, uh, sorry, the films are actually pretty close to the books. I'm very excited about Last Letter. I have to tell you, I went to the first UK screening, a private screening last night with, for journalists, and the men were crying at the <gasps> end, which Ooh! just always makes me really happy. Like, I love to see a few tears, but if you get man tears, that's like a bonus point. <laughs> Oh, score. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to bring in Margaret, our producer, because she has read during the pandemic. So she's not like okay. the guy who, you know, we were talking about who's in yeah. the, 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 the band. Um, she's an avid reader and has been <laughs> has been reading. She reads like, I don't know, 100 books a year or something wild. Wow. But hi, Margaret. Hi. But six of your books hi. during the course of the pandemic. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That's yes. research. Wow. Yes. I, you this know, I have a specific question for you. Okay. I have a lot. I had a lot of time to myself and I started with me before you, which we talked about on Kristen Hanna's podcast as what my, um, ugly cry read. Oh, okay. Yes. Cause I was sobbing at the end as you know, some tend to do. So it's funny because this book giver of stars and me before you are, the one, two of the top 40 books that were read for the 2020 Goodreads Challenge for anyone that's part of Goodreads, two of the top 40 books. Wow. So, and I was one of those people reading two of those books. So Thank I'm wondering you. what you think about Me Before You that resonates with those readers of 2020. Oh, do you know what? I've asked myself this question so many times because I wrote eight books before I wrote Me Before You. And if I'd known what the formula was, <laughs> I would have done it eight books ago. I think for me, that book sets up a series of questions which makes you think, what would I do if I were him? What would I do if I was his mother or father? What would I do if I was the person who loved a man who didn't want to be alive anymore? And it, it, it doesn't give you any answers. That's the other thing, because I don't believe there is a right answer. There's probably just the right answer for that particular person. And it was inspired for me by a true story that I'd heard on the radio, which just wouldn't leave my head about a young man who decided to do exactly that with his parents' blessing. Um, and I like stories, I guess, that make you go into the gray area your your brain wants black or white answers it wants to know that something is this way or that way and a lot of stories that i like to write about are are stories where that doesn't fit you know you can come out either side but you might not be right or wrong it's you just are um but also i think that book had it was the first book i ever used comedy in and I use comedy deliberately because it was such a bleak subject and it was so sad that I thought the only way I'm going to get people to read this is if I also make them laugh. And, and it's the first time I've tried to do that. And I think as a reader, I love things that make me laugh and I love things that make me feel anything. Actually, I, you know, I could admire lots of writing from afar, but if you can make me laugh, I will probably buy everything that you ever write or cry for that matter. So I think it's probably a combination of those things as well. And sorry, one more thing. I also didn't realize until I wrote Louisa Clark 
how many people would identify with that sense of being in your late 20s your life hasn't quite turned out how you expected and you don't really have the ambition to know what you want you're just somehow still in the same place and it's not through any fault of yours it's just how things have turned out and i think up to that point we were used to a lot of books about quite go getting sort of people and i think a lot of people who hadn't yet worked out what to do with their life identified with her yeah. Sorry, that was an incredibly long answer. Oh, I loved it. Good one. <laughs> well, and then one. and Louisa Clark's story doesn't end there, which is beautiful because you do take yeah. this very sad two-ended story and use it through the trilogy. And I thought that was beautiful and very exciting. And those bumblebee tights are yours. Is that correct? They were mine, <laughs> yes. Uh, they were such a throwaway thing. It was like I was casting around for some quirky wardrobe choice. And I remember my mom had drawn a picture of me in my favorite bumblebee tights. So I thought, oh, that'll do. And then they became iconic. And I like know. I would go around the world on tour and people would come up to me wearing them. And even the other day I saw someone wearing them and it took all I could do just not to go, is this a Louisa Clark thing? But oh, then I, I thought it'd be too that. embarrassing if they said no. <laughs> I and love like, that. Who? <laughs> no, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who is this lady? Is there when you started out with that? Did you did you plan it as a series, or was this no. that this came alive and you had to keep going? Well, I I wrote the book. I didn't expect anybody to read it. I mean, my dad used to joke that it was the book that was going to kill my career entirely, um, and it was pretty bad at that point. Uh, but somehow it just snowballed, and then it became that lovely thing that every writer dreams of—a word of mouth book. People would kind of um, press it on each other or want to. They'd do joint reads, and I started working on the film, uh, the script, a couple of years afterwards and what I found is living with the actors and living with the film script I kept thinking what would happen after that and if you are I'm an ex-journalist and the, the stories that always interested me were like what happens to the people after the thing moves on uh, what happens to the chambermaid who discovered the dead body in the room that kind of thing and so I thought after I'd written the script I just thought what would happen to her that's a huge thing to have to go through and then I, I realized that I wanted to write a kind of horseshoe-shaped trilogy where After You is actually quite a melancholy book. It's about dealing with grief mm -hmm. and trying to move forward. And then I wanted to bring her up again into kind of full, joyous mode. And that's what happened with Still Me, um, where she kind of learns how to be who she's meant to be. It was meant to be a book about kind of working out who you are in relation to the world around you. And that's one of those scenarios where that character just comes to life for you and you kind of, she's kind of telling you where she wants to go. Yeah. I mean, it was very strange writing. I've never written any uh, kind of trilogies or anything. And so it's about giving the reader enough information so that they're familiar with the story, but not uh, making it boring. And it was, it was a tricky balance, but, and I always said I would never write anything more about Louisa Clark. Cause I felt like I, I finished with her at the point that I needed her to be. And then lockdown happened oh. and, uh, my publisher, actually, it wasn't even me came up with a fantastic idea of what would happen to Lou in lockdown. And so just when we were feeling very depressed, um, was it last summer? I put out a free story uh, called Lou in Lockdown, where I revisit her. She gets stuck with her parents back in England, having moved to the US. And it was the most fun to write because I I knew the story. It was small. It, it spoke to a lot of what a lot of us were going through at the time, being confined to our homes, loneliness, missing the people that you love. And it was just a joy to revisit her. I don't think I'll revisit her again, but I was really glad that I got her back and just to say it is free and it's online so you can usually find it via my twitter feed if, that's if so cool <laughs> i know what i'm doing after this i was just gonna say that because <laughs> i read Nobody that trilogy <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> give her a few minutes she's got to go look at this up immediately jojo it was just a phenomenal treat to be able to a, initially share this book the giver of stars with our book club and hear how touched and moved and passionate our readers were about this story and what I'm a so great, happy to hear uh, that Thank and what you. a great conversation it was it just led to so much so that was a real gift in an experience and in a read and this has just been beyond so thank you so very much thank you so much for having me it's been a lot of fun
Oh my gosh, Jojo Moyes is so great. So uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to dig into her collection of phenomenal books. If you want to go to jojomoyes.com, you can see all of them because she has written a lot. But remember, the giver of stars out in paperback now. Also, she is pretty fun to follow on social media. So it's Jojo Moyes official on Instagram and Jojo Moyes on Twitter. And uh, wow, she is so great. So since in our moment with Margaret, we've been talking about uh, with the giver of stars and the pack horse librarians of Kentucky, we want to um, point our attention at some books that mention libraries or librarians because they deserve our attention. Yes. I, as others know, and I've mentioned before, my sister's a librarian, so libraries are very important to me in my life. My mom was the president of the Friends of the Library in my hometown, so Aha. very important. So got to give a lot of respect to the librarians out there. Yes. Especially during lockdown because I spent a lot of time in that parking lot picking up books. <laughs> Doing the pickups. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of writers write about librarians or library yeah, books. That makes sense. Yes. So one that I've recently read, The Lost Apothecary by Sarah yeah. Penner, actually uses um, a library or librarian to help kind of track down um, some information about a vial this, this woman mm -hmm. on a vacation um, is in England. She finds a vial on the um, riverbed of the Thames, I believe, and she doesn't really know anything about it. So she is able to track down an, um, an archive librarian, libra archive librarian, mm -hmm. I believe, and um, a research librarian. And she helps to kind of track down information about where this vial comes from, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Um, and a similar idea, um, All the Devils Are Here, Louise Penny, it's um, it's a series of thrillers uh, using a librarian to help oh, yeah. um, find out information. That was a really yeah. good book. Um, but using librarians to help track down the information when you can't find it yourself. Aha. Uh -huh. And then um, just two out of total mention, Time Tra The Time Traveler's Wife, oh, which, my yes, we, we all know and love. Um, Henry was actually a librarian in the Which I completely story. forgot that, and that means yeah. I need to revisit that book. And let me just interject. I think I've told you this before. It's very cheesy. My husband and I, before we were husband and wife, we read that book out loud to each other. Oh, boy. So I read her chapters, and he read his chapters, and we couldn't go ahead, and it was like a big bonding thing. And so I think we should probably revisit it. Oh, you had like parts. I like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never thought about that. I don't really have any guy to read parts with. Well, but. it's a good barometer. If somebody's <laughs> interested in doing this with you, then, you know, it could Absolutely. work out in the long haul because I think we're at 14 years. So kind of it's like time a, to revisit that book. It's kind of like Marjorie's man is my dream man. Exactly. If we can Sven. find that. It's all about Sven. <laughs> He's a confident dude. Yeah. <laughs> and then the one that sticks out to me always is Matilda. Yes. So I, I know this is crazy, but reading it as a kid, Matilda, Roald Dahl, that librarian helps Matilda find and nourish herself with all of this content within the book, within the books of the library, starting with children's books and working her way up into adult books. And I thought that was always so incredible how she used that to help harness her power and be just a powerful little girl. Yeah. And not surprising. I mean, so many authors use this librarian figure as sort of the guide. Obviously we talked about midnight library before, mm -hmm. and also uh, in, in the four winds, it's a small part, but a, a pivotal part um, for the daughter uh, to, to be able to connect with the librarian and have yeah. access to these stories for the first time. It's like uh, very empowering and supportive. Um, I would just mention really quick the um, the good sister, Sally Hepworth, which oh, is yeah. her latest one, and Fern in Rose. And of course, Fern is a librarian, so a lot of uh, a lot of what goes on in her life centers around the library, and it's her happy space because she would much rather be with books than humans. And there are a lot of people who feel that way. So well, <laughs> I spend a lot of my time with books. And not humans. <laughs> well, I'm glad you do because you give us great recommendations oh, and have a lot of insight to share. And I'm so glad that you also got to speak with JoJo because I know she's one of your favorites. And oh, yeah. Can't blame you. She's I'm, amazing. She is incredible. Ah, 
that was fun. Uh, well, hope you guys had fun listening to the book club podcast. And until next time, remember, keep reading or at least keep listening to people talk about books. Hopefully us. Subscribe. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.